Wealth inequality, a permanent feature apparently of capitalism. There is no capitalist economy in which there is not this kind of dramatic wealth inequality. Wealth inequality varies. If you go to Western Europe, capitalist countries, right, long-standing capitalist countries, you'll see less wealth. You'll see wealth inequality in Western Europe, the most comparable societies to the United States, but you won't see wealth inequality like you see it in the United States. But you go around the world and you see wealth inequality. You see it all over the place. You see it in the third world, you see it in the first world. Okay. That's a reality. If you want to talk about democracy, you have to talk about the connections between economic and political systems, and you have to talk about the real world in which we live. And that leads to discussions about perhaps what capitalism is. I think one of the problems in talking about this is capitalism has become so global, so normalized, right, that, it, that, that is to say it is the economic system that defines the global economy. And for a couple of decades now, there's been no significant challenge to it from a competing system. So we take capitalism just to be almost a synonym for economic activity. But in fact, capitalism is a specific system. And it, it came to be in the world in a specific way. Capitalism as a system, the system that defines our economy, has only been around for 200, maybe 250 years, depending on when you chart it. Right? A lot of people mark 1776, not because of the American Revolution, but because of the publication of Adam Smith's classic text on the economy called The Wealth of Nations. So let's say capitalism has been around for 250 years. There's one thing that you can observe in that 250 years that's undoubtedly true. Capitalism has been a wildly productive system, yes? Incredibly productive. There is no economic system in history that has been as productive as capitalism. It has spurred enormous economic growth, correct? I mean, I, I don't see how anybody could contest that. Think about the incredible expansion in that 250 years. There's been an incredible growth, economic growth, within a capitalist system. And we assume that that economic growth is a product of capitalism then, yes? The economic growth that we've experienced, which has produced the world in which we live, with all of this material comfort, right, where we sit in a, in a big room like this and project things up on the wall in a climate-controlled atmosphere, you've got to remember this this kind of world hasn't existed forever, correct? It's a relatively recent phenomenon. And often we associate this kind of growth and this material comfort with capitalism. Capitalism produced it. But we might want to step back and start asking some questions. Once you open up this and get beyond the platitudes, then you start asking questions. Well, what other, what other processes have gone forward in that same 250 years? that might have something to do with this incredible expansion of economic growth? Well, two things come to mind immediately. One is imperialism, colonialism, right? that capitalism wasn't an economic system that started in Europe, was contained in Europe, and then spread. Capitalism is a system that went forward as the Europeans went about the business of doing what? <laughs> Conquering the world. And did they conquer the world because they wanted to have a greater variety of vacation spots? Did the British conquer India because they wanted to be able to go on a, a trip to India now and then? What was the motivation of the imperial project as Europe spread around the world? Resources, yeah, yeah, resources. Resources, labor, markets. Right? So the, the development of capitalism happens to con, 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 uh, go forward with the development of imperialism and colonialism. So the story of capitalism's magical properties of growth, and it's a story you can tell, but it, the story gets a little more complicated when you realize that the original capitalist economies, Great Britain being the sort of central example, did not become wealthy simply by being creative, innovative, and productive. They also became wealthy by being violent 
and by conquering most of the rest of the world and extracting the resources out of those parts of the world for the benefit of the mother country. That's what we call colonialism, imperialism. When Britain began the conquest of India, India was actually, in some ways, a, a, a more advanced society than Britain in economic terms. Textile manufacturing, textiles, you know, making cloth is sort of the, the first big uh, move of industrial capitalism. Textile production in India was more advanced than in Britain when this process began. The British didn't bring anything to India, they destroyed India, basically, and extracted the wealth for the benefit of others. And that wealth transfer had consequences. One of the consequences is the massive death, death in India. Uh, throughout the 19th century, for instance, a lot of Indian grain was shipped from India back to England. One of the reasons that standards of living for ordinary people in Britain went up so much in the 19th century is that those resources were flowing from the colonial territories back to the mother country. Meanwhile, Indians were starving in droves, starving to death. It's a very good book called Late Victorian Holocaust by Mike Davis, which charts the hundreds of thousands of Indians who starved because the British masters had decided they would export grain back to England rather than feed people in India. So the rise of capitalism and the wildly productive capitalist system, right, creative, innovative, productive, all of those things true, are a product, you might say, not just of capitalism, but they're also a product of imperialism and colonialism. Those two processes went forward together, the development of capitalism, and the exploitation of the resources of other parts of the world by Europe. All of a sudden, the story of the magic of capitalism starts to get a little, a little cloudy, yes? Well, maybe it's more complicated. Maybe that capitalism is creative, innovative, and productive, but it also got its start through massive amounts of violence and coercion. Here's another thing that we often forget. The, the beginnings of capitalism in the late 18th century, right? the rise of what we often call industrial capitalism, the first phase of capitalism, right? the factory system, all of that. That was made possible by the invention of the steam engine and the use of originally coal and eventually oil and natural gas as well. So the magic of capitalism also happens to be connected to the magic of fossil fuels that we think about capitalism as a system that was creative, innovative, and productive, which it was, but that production also was made possible by a very unique moment in human history. The ability, never before seen in human history, to exploit enormous amounts of energy. Originally coal, eventually oil, and natural gas. You have to understand what this meant in human history. Prior to fossil fuels, human beings could not do the things we do. Energy was mostly, it's often talked about as sunlight. Right? Energy was mostly animal muscle power, human muscle power, burning things like wood, but there are limits to what you can produce by burning wood. It was not until human beings discovered how to explo exploit the energy in fossil fuels, in coal, oil, and natural gas, that this incredible production began. So the story of capitalism, creative, productive, innovative, true, is also the story of fossil fuels. And maybe it's partly the result of that incredible energy that we have all of this production, not because of capitalism, but because of this enormous reserve of energy now available, previously unavailable. Maybe any economic system that had that kind of energy would be as productive as... We don't know. I mean, these are open questions. But they complicate the story of the magic of the market. And that's the story you hear in the United States. The magic of the markets, right? Markets do no wrong. Markets provide what people want. Markets create that innovation. Markets lead to that production. There's some truth in that. It's undoubtedly true that market-based systems and the competition within them 
can lead to that kind of production. But if that's the only story we tell, if we only tell the story of the magic of the markets, then we miss at least two other important stories. The reality of the violence in imperialism and colonialism that led to the incredible expansion of the core capitalist economies primarily in Europe, also secondarily in the United States, and the subsidy of fossil fuels, you could call it. The incredible energy available through fossil fuels that comes along as capitalism develops. Take away colonialism and imperialism, take away fossil fuels, and it's not clear what changes a capitalist economy would have made. It's not clear how much of the material bounty that is now all around us would be here. We don't know. But it complicates the story. And that's what the, the class period today really is about, complicating the story. Acknowledging first that the connection between an economic and a political system is crucial. And that the, the rather simple story we tell traditionally in the United States that democracy depends on capitalism is inadequate. That it's also clear that capitalism can undermine democracy when the wealth inequality that exists, as we were observing, gives people differential abilities to affect the political process. If the political process is based on some notion of equality of citizens engaging in political activity, concentrated wealth skews that ability. And that's a question you have to deal with when you deal with democracy one way or the other. And once you start complicating that, then it's possible to step back and ask questions about some of the other, what I'll call platitudes we tell ourselves. And that's what I want you to wrestle with. So one last thing before we finish today. What's any of this got to do with journalism? Well, remember, we're spending this time at the beginning of the semester with questions of democracy because if journalism has a claim to a special status in a society, if journalism makes a claim that, listen, we do more than just give you the sports scores and the TV listings, if journalism is meaningful in a modern complex society, it's meaningful because it helps us become a more democratic society that journalism's claim to special status is, it, is rooted in its claim that it is essential to the health of a democratic society. And if journalism is going to make that claim, I'm going to argue, journalism has to deal with these kinds of realities. That journalism has to be able to tackle these fundamental questions about democracy itself. On Thursday, I'm going to give you an example of that. As I said, I won't be here on Thursday. You'll view a documentary film. It's a do Hold on, I'm not done yet. It's a documentary film about the work of a journalist I've mentioned before, a journalist named P. Sinoth, who works in India. Right? The, the film that I had mentioned that we screened yesterday in, uh, in the CMA building is one film. This is a different film. So if you came to the film yesterday, the film you're going to watch on Thursday is different. It's called A Tribe of His Own. I don't like the title very much. The tribe referred to, hold on, I'm not done yet, and the degree to which you start fussing other people can't hear. The tribe referred to in the title of this film is not a traditional tribal grouping, but a tribe of journalists that Sinoth has been influential in creating a group of journalists in India who cover the kinds of issues that you'll see discussed in the film. The film you're going to see on Thursday, A Tribe of His Own, concerns some of Sinath's earlier work on poverty and inequality in India. You're going to see how he approaches these questions, how he makes the, que the connection between democracy and economics, and then how he goes out into the field and reports on it. So I wanted to inject, even though we've, we've yet to talk in any detail about journalism in this class, it is a journalism class, and I want to inject that as we're finishing the, the segment of the course on democracy, on politics, 
I want to remind us that we care about this in this class because of its centrality to the discussion of the role of journalists.